Hello, and welcome to Out West, the official podcast of the Western Governors Association, a bipartisan organization representing the governors of the 22 westernmost states and territories. I'm Jim Augsbury, Executive Director of WGA. Today, we'll be talking about WGA's 2020 annual report, which summarizes the impactful, collaborative policy work of Western governors over the past year and foreshadows the policy agenda for the year ahead. I'm joined today by WGA's Troy Timmons, our Director of Federal Relations and Strategic Initiatives, Senior Policy Advisor Bill Whitaker, and Policy Advisors Ward Scott and Kevin Moss. WGA addresses a variety of policy issues and challenges over the course of a year, but improving the state-federal relationship is always among the highest priorities of Western governors. States are not stakeholders. They are sovereigns with constitutional powers, delegated authorities, and essential government responsibilities. Accordingly, governors aspire to work in authentic partnership with the federal government, both as co-sovereigns and co-regulators. One mechanism that the governors have used to promote a better state-federal relationship is a memorandum of understanding that WGA entered with the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 2018. The MOU establishes a framework empowering the U.S. Forest Service and WGA to collaborate on an array of challenges facing Western landscapes. I'm joined now by Troy Timmons, WGA's Director of Strategic Initiatives. Troy, what are some of the governor's goals for the MOU and shared stewardship? Well, WGA's goals for the work that we're doing under the shared stewardship MOU, we had three of them. Um, The first one was that we wanted items that were of regional significance um, and focused on regional needs. And if it didn't meet that test, then uh, projects were out. One of the other ones was that they had to involve cross-boundary elements. And by cross-boundary, we mean uh, multiple jurisdictions, private landowners, um, counties, state lands, and then the entire panoply of federal lands that that are out there. We felt that specific projects should be undertaken under the the state different state MOUs, uh, and that wasn't really appropriate for us as a regional organization to be dictating what would happen in a specific state. Um, so those were some of the goals that we had with the projects that we undertook. Have Western states embraced the shared stewardship strategy? Oh, absolutely. And uh, we've got 11 uh, of our Western states that have signed stewardship agreements with uh, USDA. More are coming. We know of at least two that are pretty close to signature. So just from that standpoint, it's been a really uh, encouraging thing to see that level of state and federal engagement across uh, the WGA states. And what about WGA's involvement in particular? WGA has been involved in three different activities under the MOU. The first one is on interagency wildfire disaster response. And what we've done under that is tried to look at um, how do we help communities in a post-fire situation. One of the things is that many of these communities don't have access to good information about the programs that are available to help with post-fire restoration. And, and so that activity is trying to establish um, a framework for local communities um, state and, and states and the federal government to, to be able to cooperate more effectively on post-fire response. One of the really encouraging um, elements of that work has been that we've engaged not only USDA that we have the MOU with, but an entire spectrum of federal agencies, um, land managers, uh, agencies that handle disaster response, uh, and the scientific research that goes into those um, restoration projects. So it's we've been able to utilize that MOU to, to get at not just the agency that, that we have that relation or the MOU with, but an entire range of federal agencies. So it's been a really positive experience. Thanks, Troy. 
clearly the MOU has been an engine of significant policy work at WGA. Now I'd like WGA senior policy advisor Bill Whitaker to join the conversation. Bill, you've worked on two efforts as part of the shared stewardship MOU, one on vegetation management, another on invasive species. Can you explain WGA's work on vegetation management? Absolutely. So for those who don't know, vegetation management is work to control the growth of brush and trees in and around power lines to reduce um, the risk of wildfire. And it's a really challenging issue because it involves doing work across administrative lines, across state boundaries, across all sorts of jurisdictions. And it's exactly the type of issue that WGA is suited to address. So our work on this started um, about a year and a half ago, then uh, during a time when there were a lot of really high profile fires that were started by power lines in California and then vice versa, a lot of power lines that were impacted by wildfire. And it's a really real challenge, um, very highly visible. So uh, a lot of diff- governors said that they wanted WGA to take this on as an issue. Uh, USDA was very interested in taking this on in electrical utilities. And the um, folks who do the work too, the utility arborists really were, were interested in getting involved. So d- what we did at WGA, we brought together all those folks who were involved on doing this. The forest service, the Bureau of Land Management, governors, state agencies to facilitate a dialogue and try to get everybody in a room to try to figure out new solutions. And there were really a um, series of conversations, series of phone calls, a lot of really great dialogue between those groups. And I think we really heard some good feedback that those were conversations that really weren't being held anywhere else. In addition to that work, Bill, WGA has produced an invasive annual grass toolkit. Can you tell us a little about that project? Sure. The toolkit has three elements, a roadmap, case studies, and a data layer. The roadmap is a new conceptual model for invasive annual grass management in the West that builds on existing proven invasive species management practices where you identify core areas of where the rangeland is still relatively intact and not as impacted by cheatgrass. You focus effort on those and you um, really defend those areas through a method called early detection and rapid response and then you grow those areas and you work out to expand the edges. That's been in practice for a long time in various um, smaller areas but this is the first time there's ever really been a regional focus on this. There's also case studies of where those principles have worked both for widely distributed species like cheatgrass, an example in Idaho, and then for more narrowly distributed species like Venadonna and Medusa head in Wyoming. And then third, there's a brand new data layer that knits together a lot of the existing publicly available data layers that are already out there. There's been a lot of great work done by the Natural Resource Conservation Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and the U.S. Geological Survey, and um, with states as well, to try to come together and identify where cheatgrass and invasive annual grasses are most prevalent but one of the in the west but one of the issues is is that there were three or four maps so if you're out there trying to manage lands in the west you don't know which uh which version of the map to work on. So what we did is we brought together the folks who work, who manage those data layers, and knitted together, for the first time ever, a common data layer for invasive annual grass management in the West. And so what it is, it's an online platform, and it's a tool where it's uh, at a 30 meter resolution, uh, a brand new snapshot of where there is and there isn't invasive, uh, heavily invaded areas in the West. And if you're a land manager, this is extremely useful because now everybody in the West is working off of the same layer. So when you're trying to find projects across state lines, across outside of your county, trying to find your neighbors to work with on a project, everybody is using the same um, data layer. And that's extremely valuable. How will the new toolkit change how invasive species are managed in the West? So as I mentioned, the concepts and the roadmap aren't new. It's just the first time that these have really been adopted or um, looked at from a regional perspective. This The concept of uh, looking, focusing your efforts on the areas that are pristine, That's people have been doing that at different points across the West for a long time. What's really different is the leadership that governors have shown in uh, trying to encourage people to apply these concepts in their own way. And the, so getting local managers to look at this tool, th- these concepts, and look at where they're doing work on their lands, where their neighbors are doing work, we're looking at the using the data layer to find where there's opportunities for new 
cross-boundary collaborative work. And I really think that's where it's going to be most useful, is allowing land managers to identify places that they can work across the fence, across jurisdictional lines, and find new projects and, um, that they weren't able to do otherwise. Thanks, Bill. Of course, the MOU projects represent just a fraction of WGA's multifaceted policy work. The Working Lands Roundtable is a platform WGA uses to pursue the governor's priorities related to natural resources in the West. In addition to executing the Shared Stewardship MOU, the Roundtable is focused on regional issues such as forest and rangeland management, water, and invasive species, to name just a few. I'd like to engage WGA policy advisor Ward Scott to discuss the governor's policy efforts related to water. Ward, the Army Corps of Engineers recently announced that it has withdrawn its proposed surplus water rule. Can you discuss that issue and WGA's involvement? Sure, Jim. As you know, Western governors have long been dedicated to preserving state sovereign authority to manage, allocate, and protect their water resources. The Corps' proposed surplus water rule was developed without adequate state consultation and ran afoul of Congress's directives that the Corps operate its reservoirs in deference to states' water laws and systems of allocation. As it was proposed, the rule would have significantly interfered with state-approved water users' access to waters stored in core reservoirs, which in some western states, such as North and South Dakota along the Missouri River, comprise a substantial per- percentage of available surface waters. In addition to its own substantial outreach over the last three years, WGA has assembled a coalition of state associations, including the Conference of Western Attorneys General and the Western States Water Council, to successfully advocate for the rules withdrawal earlier this year. What do you see as the next steps for WGA and states on this issue, Ward? While this was a significant victory for Western states, WGA will continue to pursue legislative and regulatory solutions to ensure that existing policies and future regulations covering the core reservoirs and their operations recognize and defer to state laws and authority. I'm bringing Bill Whitaker back into the conversation to talk more about WGA's work on invasive species. Bill, what are the governors doing about the increasing threat of quagga and zebra mussels? Thanks, Jim. Yes, this is uh, another invasive species that Western governors have identified as a very high priority. Quag and zebra mussels are a huge threat to Western waterways. They impact hydropower, they impact irrigation, native species recreation, you name it, on uh, water bodies and rivers in the West. And they're extremely hard to control. Once they're established in a water body, they're basically impossible to, to remove, and they move very easily across watercraft from recreational watercraft or of any kind from one waterway to another. So it takes a tremendous amount of work and coordination from state and federal agencies and local groups across the West to uh, set up decontamination and inspection and decontamination uh, spots for these the watercraft to prevent the movement of the mussels. And that's uh, that takes a lot of work. That takes a, a lot of deliberate coordination and collaboration across state lines. And so Western governors have really been in the middle of that conversation, really central to efforts to get state and federal agencies working together more effectively on boat inspections and decontaminations. That takes a lot of forms, um, but we, some of it is through uh, just our engagement with the administration, our uh, engagement with Congress on pieces of legislation that could make that collaboration easier. And some of it's through just convening and facilitating conversations between key groups. For example, in August 2019, Western Governors hosted the Invasive Muscle Leadership Forum in Las Vegas, Nevada. That forum assembled state and federal and tribal agency staff to really get everyone together to work to find common interagency priorities for the prevention of cont- and containment of these mussels in Western waters. It was a really great event. Two days, uh, we had a keynote from Governor Steve Sisolak, uh, Governor of Nevada, and about 75 people attended. Great, great participation. We went out to Lake Mead in about 105 degree heat to watch a boat inspection in person, which for a lot of the folks who work on the policy, I think is really valuable to see the work that's being done on the ground of this. And then we got back together and just rolled up our sleeves for a day and a half long conversation, trying to find new solutions and new ways that state and federal agencies can work together to help control the spread of the mussels. Bill, the Western Governor has recently created the Western Invasive Species Council. Tell us more about the council and how it supports WJ's work on invasive species. Sure. 
So the council was created by Western governors in the most recent uh, Western governors policy resolution on biosecurity and invasive species management. And in that resolution, the governors uh, called for the creation of WISC to enhance coordination between existing state invasive species councils and to um, help improve communication and collaboration between uh, regional biosecurity and invasive species issues. So there's a lot of states that already have existing mechanisms for invasive species collaboration with their own states. There's a lot of really great and effective invasive species councils, state level invasive species councils, or various state um, agencies work within their borders. But there really hasn't been a group that has brought those groups uh, together, those different invasive species councils together to talk and to co coordinate amongst each other. Similarly, there's a lot of really great groups that do work on zebra mussels, say, or on cheatgrass, and they work on a specific taxa of species, but they don't really come together to coordinate on all invasive species, and the concept of invasive species as a sort of more global threat to Western resources. So this, that is one of the main purposes of this group, is to get those um, folks together to have these conversations and to help start to identify those regional threats. Another benefit, too, is as we've discussed, Western governors are doing a ton of work on invasive species. Having this group together as an advisory group to governors to provide technical assistance to governors on some of these really complex, tricky questions has been um, enormously helpful to WGA. And so if we have a difficult question and we need invasive species experts to help us out, we've got just a, a group of experts already assembled through the council. Troy, to help us wrap up this discussion on the Working Lands Roundtable, can you discuss its other work, including WGA's response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Sure. And the Roundtable is a great venue to discuss a, a wide range of land management issues. For example, we looked at the effect that COVID-19 has had on natural resource management. We looked at the uh, effect that it's had on wildfire response, and that's a huge issue in Western states. And not only are you trying, are those land management agencies trying to address the wildfires that we've seen throughout the West, but also trying to address uh, COVID-19 and the outbreaks that they've had with firefighters. And that's one of the things that we've been able to use the round table to examine. NWGA has done a couple of different webinars on on those subjects. Um, we've looked, we've used the roundtable to look at how changes to NEPA might affect resource management across Western states, um, and and it's important. Healthy communities create healthy ecosystems, and local funding. Um, programs like PILT and SRS are a critical resource for those local communities. And especially as COVID-19 uh, effects roll through our state and local economies, um, those resources are even more critical to ensuring that, that they can be deployed effectively um, across landscapes. That's a diverse body of work. Uh, yes, it is, and it and it builds on several previous WJ initiatives. And we've we've done initiatives on drought, on species conservation, forest and rangeland management, uh, biosecurity and invasives, and all of those different initiatives feed into the work that the roundtable is doing. Um, it also brings together a a wide variety of uh, different land management experts, um, the actual land managers, uh, wildlife specialists, private landowners, uh, non-governmental organizations. And what the round table allows us to do is take all of that specialized knowledge and have those experts look at some of the broader land management challenges that, uh, we face throughout the West. That broader perspective you mentioned, Troy, is an important consideration. Governors really do have to balance multiple objectives, don't they? Uh, eg exactly. They're looking at wildlife diversity and wildfire management in invasive species and, and local economies. It's, it's a lot to take in. Um, and the roundtable hopefully provides 
good insights and tools to help governors make those difficult decisions that they have on different management challenges uh, across the western states. Now we're joined by policy advisor Kevin Moss to discuss broadband connectivity, an issue that has gained tremendous currency because of a spike in remote work and distance learning caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Kevin, some people might assume that high-speed internet is ubiquitous nationwide, but in many Western communities, that's just not the case. Can you explain some of the factors that limit broadband access? Sure. Thanks, Jim. I think the main thing to note is just the fact that building broadband networks is incredibly expensive, whether you're laying miles and miles of fiber to a rural community or constructing wireless antennas. Those things aren't cheap, and that is really the main reason that a lot of rural communities in the West lack broadband infrastructure. And another important aspect to consider is the fact that private industry, whether it's a, you know, a big uh, broadband provider or someone else is going to be financing that infrastructure. And so they need to, you know, to see that they're going to have a good return on their investment in terms of the number of consumers that they have in a potential service territory. So that cost factor is really the main uh, limiting issue in terms of broadband access in the West. So if this issue is really about private capital financing, what role do governors, states, and federal agencies play? So federal agencies are a really important um, entity in the broadband deployment uh, sphere. And so um, the FCC is responsible for mapping broadband coverage at a national level. And so that's obviously incredibly important in terms of you know influencing federal investment. We need to know where broadband is and isn't in order to deploy public dollars effectively. And I think a big priority for Western governors as well is making sure that broadband programs are designed in a way that works and makes sense in the rural West. Governors want to be using federal dollars in a way that is, you know, targeting the most unserved or highly underserved areas in the country. We want those public dollars to be going to places where there's really no market reason for um, private broadband deployment. And we think that's the best way to get um, connectivity out to the rural West. And then I think a few more niche issues is just that governors see a lot of potential in leveraging what are known as community anchor institutions. And so those are hospitals, schools, libraries, those sorts of core community institutions that are likely to already have broadband internet access. And we think there are some creative ways that federal programs can leverage those existing anchor institutions to essentially spur connectivity into the surrounding area. So that's a strategy that we endorse pretty highly in our new policy resolution. Where do tribal communities fit into this effort? In terms of tribal communities, they're a really important um, aspect of the broadband puzzle to consider. Essentially, in the West, any any tribal community is likely to have um, an even harder time getting broadband access than a rural community. They're likely to be more, um, you know, more have more distance from physical broadband infrastructure, um, just be more disconnected, have less existing infrastructure to build off of. Um, And so that's why Western governors are such staunch advocates for connecting tribal communities and why, um, in our recently passed broadband connectivity resolution, why they've made that such a priority in terms of supporting those communities and making sure that federal programs are directing funds to tribal areas. What role does cybersecurity play in WGA's work on broadband connectivity? Sure. So cybersecurity is a really important factor to consider in the whole, you know, broadband ecosystem. Um, Obviously, as you get more devices and areas connected to the internet, um, there's going to be more opportunities for a bad actor to infiltrate a network. And so as we've been building out our broadband policy, we've also been thinking about cybersecurity. And I think a really important example is just the number of cyber attacks that have occurred since the COVID-19 pandemic started, um, as a lot of schools and libraries and um, places of work, you know, tried to increase their digital offerings. Um, they've been more, um, they've been the target of a lot more cyber attacks. And so um, folks have probably heard in the news about healthcare facilities or educational institutions suffering from those attacks. And so that's certainly an issue that's really important to Western governors. How do you see WGA working on cybersecurity in the future? Sure. So one model that um, we're really interested in is a concept that's coming out of North Dakota. Um, they have a really robust cyber um, defense strategy across their state. And so they've uh, sort of hypothesized that there are some opportunities in terms of regional state-to-state coordination um, for cyber attacks and defending against them. So if one state were to suffer a serious cyber attack, that you could essentially deputize um, employees from from another state uh, to help deal with that attack. 
And so that way, states are stronger together by entering into these sort of collaborative multi-state cyber defense agreements. So that's a concept that we're going to be exploring with the CIOs of Western states, and we're uh, excited to carry that concept forward. Thanks, Kevin. Western governors are making a big difference and having a positive and demonstrable impact on life in the West. Today's discussion doesn't even come close to covering all of the policy issues addressed in WGA's 2020 annual report, nor does it touch on the Reimagining the Rural West initiative, the central policy effort of WGA's immediate past chair, North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum. However, you can find downloadable copies of the annual and initiative reports, as well as all of WGA's policy resolutions on our website at westgov.org. Thanks for listening to this episode of Out West, presented by the Western Governors Association. And a special thanks to WGA's Troy Timmons, Bill Whitaker, Ward Scott, and Kevin Moss for their work on behalf of the Western Governors. Happy trails, everyone.